let's get things started. Um, right now, we are going to launch session 1A uh, with Chair Dr. Jonathan Abelie. So uh, let me introduce you, Dr. Abelie. He is a specialist in nuclear medicine and diagnostic radiology working in Edmonton, Alberta. He is a partner with Medical Imaging Consultant, MIC, and is an associate professor in the Department of Radiology and Diagnostic Imaging at the University of Alberta. He is also a board member of the Canadian Association of Nuclear Medicine, and he is particularly interested in clinical application of hybrid imaging, including PET-CT and SPECT-CT. Um, Dr. Abelie, thank you so much for chairing this session. And now the floor is yours. Uh, great. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for attending uh, attending the first session. Uh, it's been a few years in the making, so it's great to see everyone here. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Ho Jen as our first speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Jen is a clinical professor in the Department of Radiology and Diagnostic Imaging at the University of Alberta. He is a partner in medical imaging consultants and a, a colleague of mine. Um, he was my program director when I first uh, started, a, a very young program director. Um, and uh, he's an integral part of our department and has been for a, a few decades. Uh, Dr. Jen is trained and licensed in both nuclear medicine and diagnostic radiology. Um, he has a specific interest in musculoskeletal imaging, particularly bone scintigraphy, uh, spec CT, uh, MRI, and the correlation between these modalities. Outside of medicine, he builds and flies freestyle drones. Um, some of the uh, uh, pictures yesterday, he was texting me, saying, telling me how he drove, flies his drones around those buildings, uh, the cyclotron buildings in Edmonton. He also has a passion for growing carnivorous plants, which is a little unusual. He's got a big carnivorous plant field. Um, anyway, I thank, I thank him for presenting today, and I'm, I'm confident you'll value his perspective. Uh, Dr. Jen. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, John. Can you hear me? Can Can you just verify that you can hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, excellent. And uh, you can see my screen, everyone? Uh, yeah, we can see your screen and uh, we can see you too. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Well, um, greetings from Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, it's uh, nice and fresh in the morning right now, and those of you uh, in the audience from Alberta know exactly how fresh and early it really is. Uh, uh, greetings to all of you in Montreal, which happens to be my hometown, and uh, I'd like to thank you for attending. Now, I know that uh, my topic is not the most exciting uh, on your program, so I, I would really like to thank you all for attending, but I really would, would like to try and convince you all that uh, the old-fashioned, archaic uh, nuclear medicine bone scan still has a lot to offer in this uh, modern day of imaging. And uh, I do believe that with the uh, benefit of modern instrumentation and with and if we borrow some concepts from uh, musculoskeletal imaging, uh, it, it is a lot more powerful than you may think. Um, I have no disclosures. All I want to say to you from this slide is that I, I come from a balanced perspective. That is to say, I do spend half my time uh, practicing general nuclear medicine, which includes PET-CT uh, PET imaging, and half my time uh, uh, in uh, practicing musculoskeletal radiology, and most of that time uh, doing MRI in the MRI department. I, I see a balanced uh, a mix uh, between uh, complicated uh, in-hospital patients as opposed to less complicated, uh, relatively well outpatients. And within that well, that outpatient population, I also see elite athletes, which includes uh, professional sports organizations that you may recognize here, including college athletes as well. Well, let's uh, to get some perspective, let's start with classical bone scintigraphy. I think you'll all agree with me that the just uh, the planar uh, bone scan images has come a long way since the old days of strontium, and just just planar images along with modern imaging can really give you spectacular uh, resolution and detail on the bone scan. So much so that we all know that one of the absolute criteria for a 100% normal uh, pediatric bone scan is to, to say that you are able to see that crisp uh, growth plate. And of course, that's maximum uh, in adolescence. And, uh, and of course, the growth plate fuses uh, uh, by adulthood. And as you 
uh, age, uh, the target to background ratio starts to reduce so that by the time of the elderly, now, you know, just <laughs> elderly, that's basically how old I am. You can tell this uh, slide is quite old. <laughs> um, we've always been able to perform the SPECT imaging, and then I do mean SPECT without SPECT CT, and that afforded some anatomy. You can certainly see the difference between vertebral body and posterior elements. And uh, but from planar from the planar imaging literature alone, there's a ton of uh, information. You know, we all learn normal variants. So, for example, the segmented manubrium, which can have a segmented appearance that's not pathology, hyperostosis frontalis interna in women, um, the the symmetrically distributed stippled appearance of the of the ribs uh, is a normal appearance from muscle attachments. Uh, the, the chondroid rest was published decades ago as a normal variant along sutural margins. Uh, and occasionally you see a little photopenic spot centrally in the lower sternum, and that's variant anatomy, it's not pathology. And those of us who have to report pediatric imaging are quite familiar with the issue of pubic synchondrosis, whether you're looking at a bone scan or a radiograph or even CT. We all know that's a normal variant, but let us not forget that that normal variant can be traumatized, so beware. We're often called to look at malignancy. And so, you know, the metastatic lesion is one of the first things we recognize immediately an intense focal uptake, like a cannonball that doesn't respect anatomy, although it has a predilection for axial and proximal appendicular skeleton. That is to say, marrow space. So, of course, we all learn what marrow space is. Now, it used to be said that uh, if you see a focal lesion in the vertebral body, that's more likely malignant than if you saw a focal lesion in the posterior elements. That's probably true. But of course, we all know that there are exceptions. You can certainly see metastasis in the posterior elements. And of course, as bone metastasis becomes more numerous, uh, it can start to coalesce so that the ultimate is to see a malignant super scan uh, with all the features of a super scan, high target to background ratio, absence of renal uptake, very little soft tissue activity. And uh, what, gives away, uh, the, what gives away the malignant etiology is the heterogeneity of uptake with discrete focal areas of uptake. And uh, we all recognize that if you see a cold lesion with surrounding hot activity, it's highly predictive of a lytic lesion on a radiograph. And sometimes that cold lesion can be very subtle. And unfortunately, we all do know quite well that, on, that some malignancies just absolutely will not manifest anything on a bone scan, just will not show any osteoblastic response, such as multiple myeloma. And other manifestations of malignancies include uh, patchy uptake in the liver from liver metastasis. You can have peritoneal distribution of tracer uptake with malignant ascites. And if you have malignant uh, peritoneal malignancy and if you get discrete or mental cakes, they can show uh, focal uh, geographic areas of uptake that is a malignant pattern. Uh, sometimes you get skin changes with breast cancer and radiation ports are not difficult to, rec uh, to identify. The metabolic bone disease is a pattern we all learn well as a resident. Uh, that, that includes hyperparathyroidism, osteomalacia, renal osteous dystrophy really is a combination of those two with additional soft tissue changes. And we recognize the pattern quite well, very high target to background ratio, very little renal uptake, um, prominence of calvarium and mandibular uptake. And with renal disease, with renal osteodystrophy, you can have prominence of soft tissue pathologies such as lung uptake. So that, for example, in difficult cases such as this one, this young lady presented with uh, disseminated lytic expanse out bone lesions of unknown etiology believed to represent end-stage bone metastasis. Uh, many, many MRIs and bone biopsies afterwards were all non-diagnostic. And it wasn't until a bone scan was performed uh, that we finally recognized that this is a metabolic bone disease pattern with, with a few superimposed areas of um, cold lesions that corresponded with the expanse lytic lesion. So it's it's not a wild leap uh, to to consider that perhaps we are looking at metabolic bone disease uh, with brown tumors. And here's the confirmatory uh, Sestamivi scan showing the active parathyroid adenoma. So the key is to recognize that metabolic bone disease pattern. Marrow expansion is another pattern we all learn. Uh, uh, prominence of distal uh, appendicular uptake, particularly with periarticular prominence, as long as it's nice and symmetric. So this is a marrow expansion pattern. 
as you see here in this patient with Waldenstrom's disease, or as you see here in this patient with sickle cell anemia, where you have actual metaphyseal prominence, very symmetric. And the difference between metabolic bone disease and marrow expansion is that uh, with metabolic bone disease, you see the prominence of calvario uptake, mandibular uptake, uh, you see soft tissue uh, uptake, you see absence of renal activity, you see very high target tobacco, and those are all absent with marrow expansion pattern. Paget's disease is a fun uh, pattern we all learn. It's essentially, it's a game of name that bone. If you can name that bone with in diffuse, intense uptake, it's Paget's disease. So here we go, name that bone, the manubrium, the clavicle, the uh, right ilium, the uh, proximal femur with a nice uh, uniform geographic pattern and a sharp cutoff, uh, the proximal tibia, uh, the scapula, uh, the sphenoid bone with its greater and lesser wings, uh, the occipital bone, and let's not forget that the occipital bone does include the occipital condyles, that's what these two dots are, and of course the uh, the dens uh, with its odontoid process, very distinct. Fractures are intuitive, intense linear uptake tells you there's a fracture, fractures have a certain uh, chronology of the turning positive that we all memorize, fractures have a variable rate of uh, resolution, well documented uh, in the older literature. Um, uh, fractures, sometimes fractures, bone injury is not a fracture, perhaps you can have contusion and just uh, as, a, as, a, just as an introduction I'll remind you that we actually can see contusion on a bone scan. Uh, fractures are sometimes not obvious until you get the appropriate uh, uh, st um, spot view. And sometimes fractures or the etiology of the fracture is given by their distribution, as you see here in this patient with a steering wheel injury and therefore benign rib fractures and a sternal fracture. And uh, the completion of the pelvic ring uh, is a good indication of a of benign post-traumatic fractures you see here with sacrum and the um, <clears throat> pubic rami completes the ring. And uh, particularly in the elderly, fractures evolve with time. We all know that. So that if a fracture is perhaps equivocal on day two, it may be a little more definitive uh, on a follow-up bone scan, say ex this example in day six. Some fractures have unusual orientation, as you see here with a spiral fracture. And some fractures are just very difficult to diagnose. So, oh, sorry, um, one step back. Uh, stress injury. A stress injury can be thought of on a continuum uh, from a shin splint, uh, which is a benign post-traumatic periostitis due to classically to the soleus muscle attachment. So from a shin splint to something more focal and discrete, which is a low-grade stress fracture, to an outright high-grade stress fracture, which spans the full shaft width of the bone. The sacral insufficiency fracture is a classic uh, planar pattern that we all learn. Uh, it's withstood decades of literature. Uh, many uh, an imager have fallen uh, drastically by not recognizing a sacral insufficiency fracture. The important thing to remember about a sacral insufficiency fracture is that the classic Honda sign can have variants. You can miss a horizontal bar, you can miss a vertical bar, you can miss a vertical and a horizontal bar. Important to recognize that particularly with the uh, classic history, sudden onset uh, atraumatic pain, uh, that that is a Honda sign. A benign sacral fracture. So for example, uh, that particular case which occurred back in the days uh, where we had film, I literally had the uh, bone biopsy needle in my hand uh, about to perform the procedure when at the last minute I was forced enough to pull out a bone scan in the film jacket. Seeing this, I, I, I canceled the bone biopsy. Uh, that is a benign sacral insufficiency fracture. Some fractures are just very difficult to diagnose. This is not a... <clears throat> This is not a shin splint. Uh, this is a uh, longitudinal cortical fracture. Rare, but it can occur. Uh, this looks like metastasis, but it's not. It is a fracture. Uh, this perhaps looks malignant, but it's not. It's a benign uh, acetabular fracture on MRI. Enthesopathy is not difficult to recognize as long as you recognize the tendon attachment. So quadriceps tendon, patellar tendon, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, gluteal tendon attachments. And uh, this doesn't particularly look like uh, tendon attachment until you get the appropriate posterolateral lateral oblique view and you, real, and you recognize that, in fact, that is the greater tubercle, so rotator cuff attachment. And at sites of tendon attachment, you can get a traction uh, injury, chronic traction stress, which is the etiology of the accessory navicular syndrome. Uh, 
Uh, and the lateral epicondylitis is just an extreme version of traction stress where you have an actual tear of common extensor tendon that you can see on a planar bone scan. Bone scan is very good at showing you the distribution of an active systemic arthritis. Uh, and uh, sometimes the distribution and, uh, alone will tell you the nature of the arthritis. This is classic rheumatoid. Won't go into all the details. That's classic rheumatoid. This is classic osteoarthritis with the first CMT, PIP, DIP. This is sort of classic serial negative arthritis with radiocarpal and a somewhat, somewhat of a ray distribution. Now, that, this does not particularly look like arthritis, uh, but those of us who have to do facet injection are quite familiar <clears throat> with the fact that the facet joint has a, has a big coronal orientation on a coronal plane. And so, for example, that is a facet joint distribution. And therefore, that is the same patient as this on the same day. That is a facet joint. This may look like metastasis to the humeral head, but it's not. An appropriate posterolateral lateral oblique view will show you that that's actually arthritis, clearly. The blood pool component of a bone scan can be useful for showing tenosynovitis. Um, ankylosing spondylitis, we don't see as often today. Um, MRI has somewhat taken over, particularly in my department, where my ex-chairman is world famous for ankylosing spondylitis research, so has taken... Uh, much of our work, previous work away, but appropriately so. But just, just, uh, just to review the classic pattern of bilateral symmetric sacroiliitis with prominent spine uptake, the spondylitis component. And of course, as that, uh, as that disease progresses, SI joints will become less active as it fuses and you're left just with spine activity. And uh, in the late stages, there may be very little manifestation apart from just very subtle uh, uh, spine uptake. Um, even in the planar literature, impingement patterns have been well documented, all in a lunate impingement. This one is chronic because of cystic change on the radiograph. And again, just from classic scintigraphy literature, an posterior ankle impingement, well demonstrated here. Chronic regional pain syndrome, type 1, used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, is a regional asymmetry in flow, blood pooling, and in delayed images, chronic regional pain syndrome. Now, even in classic uh, scintigraphy literature, we've always been able to see uh, large soft tissue pathology. So when you have muscle uh, injury, for example, as in this weightlifter, teres major, trapezius, uh, pectoralis major muscles, easy to diagnose. And of course, big areas of moderate, moderate to intense soft tissue uptake always makes you think of uh, ossification. And then if you have additional radiographs or other imaging to show that it's a benign or malignant pattern, you can diagnose things such as myositis ossificans. So that's just even from classical literature. And again, from classical literature, we all, or from classical patterns, we all recognize altered bile distribution patterns. For example, this patient had a lung scan the day prior to the bone scan. This patient had a MIBI scan with residual colonic activity, radiation port, this patient has a right MCA infarct, right, with the resultant breakdown in blood-brain barrier and the in inappropriate brain parenchymal uptake of bone tracer. Um, the old techniques of planar imaging are still very useful, still legitimate. Please, please, please continue to teach them to our residents. They're still very useful. For example, uh, that's not pathology. That's just overlap. You can prove it with a raised scapular view. Um, do not let the technical staff fool you into thinking that you can necessarily see lateral epicondylitis on the lateral spot view, because this patient definitely has lateral epicondylitis. Um, remember Sorensen and Phelps, right? We were all forced to learn nuclear medicine physics. Remember, maximum resolution occurs with the object uh, closest to the detector, so you can't necessarily see the sacral fracture on this patient unless you do the appropriate view with the object closer to the camera. So from classic um, uh, planar patterns, we, are, we, uh, we all learn and recognize classic pathologies such as hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, um, sickle cell uh, disease with the marrow expansion pattern and classic splenic uptake. Um, osteoid osteoma, obviously, with a double density sign. That's a terrible phrase, by the way. <clears throat> For some reason, Royal College examiners and Royal College uh, exam situations alike just are, are just fixated on this entity syndrome of synovitis, acne, pustulosis, hyperostosis with its uh, thoracic and spine manifestation. We won't spend too much time on that. It's just a, 
a classic rare pathology. We all recognize the vascular necrosis of the femoral head. In an elderly patient, if you see that, you, you know, I, I think the most appropriate first diagnosis is just plain old uh, secondary osteoarthritis of the posterior subtalar joint now. I suppose in a younger patient, no history of trauma, you can certainly think about talocalcaneal coalition, another favorite rural college exam. I, I would insist, though, if you're going to call it that, you have to also, in the na same breath, insist that that is a fibrous talocalcaneal coalition because it's not possible if an, in, with the osseous form to get that kind of bone reaction. It's got to be fibrous. Rare complication of renal failure, calciphylaxis with its extensive soft tissue uptake. Um, an extensive uh, areas, uh, area of soft tissue tracer uptake uh, can be seen with uh, tumoral calcinosis, whether primary or secondary. Secondary uh, caused by renal failure, probably more common. Um, there are some diseases which you can really diagnose only as a diagnosis of exclusion. You can't put that diagnosis first. You have to make sure uh, of all your check marks, uh, <clears throat> negative biopsies, cultures, etc. For example, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis in kids here with clavicular involvement, or this adult uh, um, pathology, migratory osteoporosis with multiple patches of relatively intense bone uh, tracer uptake. Uh, with concordant bone marrow edema on MRI. Again, you can only make that diagnosis with an appropriate negative biopsy. So yours truly did the biopsy here, and I'm allowed to make that diagnosis after a negative biopsy. <laughs> um, an arterial injection is characterized by a glove and stocking pattern. Uh, frostbite is essentially, it's a syntographic amputation of the digits. Now, classically, you're supposed to spare the thumb, so clearly this this poor fellow didn't read the textbooks before he went out and gave himself frostbite. Um, contiguous hot vertebral bodies is a pattern uh, for discitis. Uh, very nice if you see it. I, I, I don't think the sensitivity for that finding is all that high. Um, intense uptake on one side of a knee joint compartment, particularly the condyle, particularly the femoral condyle, is a classic pattern of uh, the entity previously called SONC, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. And of course, we all know from MSK imaging literature, that's not really necrosis. We don't call it that anymore. It's, a, it's an insufficiency fracture. Most MRI scanners will show you a very discrete fracture line, subchondral fracture line. Intense uptake in a broad zone always uh, uh, makes us think of ossification on a bone scan. And if it starts to look ugly, we certainly worry about osteosarcoma, as you see here. And if you see that process in too many locations, you can perhaps think of the rare uh, uh, syndrome of fibro dysplasia ossificans progressiva. So that's just a quick tour of classic scintigraphy, and I haven't shown you anything you don't already know. I really want to focus on what I consider the contemporary bone scan uh, with these key points. We have to emphasize anatomy. I, I want to introduce to you the thought that we can see bone marrow edema on a bone scan, not often emphasized, in fact, not emphasized in our literature. There's a heavy use of spec CT. And I, I also want to try and convince you all that occasionally you can directly see soft tissue pathology with our bone tracer. So first anatomy, of course, if you can recognize tendon attachments, okay, you will, po you will possibly make that correct diagnosis when you see a focus in an unusual location that it's a tendon attachment of some sort. The specific muscle that's being outlined by tracer does matter uh, with respect to the diagnosis sometimes. Um, so this is a major concept shift. I want to introduce the thought that in nuclear medicine, just on a plain bone scan, we can see the entity known as bone marrow edema, okay? So bone marrow edema is a, is a descriptive term. It's not a diagnostic term. It's a descriptive term uh, coined uh, from MRI. And I, I don't want to bore you with the detail, but if you look up the pathology on what constitutes bone marrow edema, it is anything but edema. It's an actual bone reaction. And if, again, if you review the pathology for all the various syndromes of bone marrow edema, you will understand why absolutely we can and we should see it on a bone scan. So as an example, this patient sustained contusion. Here's his bone scan. Here, sorry, here's his MRI. Here's his bone scan. Uh, this patient, obviously, that's osteoid osteoma. I just want to emphasize how even on a planar image, you can see the bone marrow edema that's beautifully outlined 
on MRI, and, you can, and obviously much better demonstrated on SPECT CT. Now, so again, let, let just uh, just um, allow me to just take just a minute of your time, and I just want to emphasize and demonstrate how why it is bone marrow edema is such a powerful observation and why it's so diagnostically useful. So, in a traumatic setting, bone marrow edema can can be seen with a direct blow. Basically, it's contusion. You can see it as contusion. For example, here the uh, the, the femoral condyle. This is a specific a uh, bone contusion pattern. Anyone who reports MRIs of the knee can tell you that that patient uh, tore uh, his or her ACL. That is a specific contusion pattern. Uh, this contusion pattern tells you the patient had a lateral patellar dislocation. Bone marrow edema is sometimes seen as a, a reaction to the avulsive uh, force from a ligament injury, as you see here with an MCL injury or here with a Lisfranc injury, here's the bone uh, marrow edema, or posterior lateral corner injury from a major knee injury, extensive bone marrow edema. This elbow injury has ulnar collateral ligament tear, here's the bone marrow edema uh, on one side, here's bone marrow edema on the other compartment from axial loading. Uh, bone marrow edema sometimes is, is a reaction to altered biomechanics. It's a biomechanical reaction, that's a mild stress response essentially, and you can see with advanced osteoarthritis, you can see it with um, early osteoarthritis, where the cartilage has not yet even thinned, and here's the bone marrow edema. You can see it in impingement syndromes. You can see it from um, um, just a meniscus injury. I'm not showing the meniscus injury here, but the bone marrow edema is a reaction to a meniscus injury on this MRI. Bone marrow edema sometimes is a reaction to um, um, tendinopathy, as we see here with flexor tendinopathy of the wrist, tendinopathy of the tibialis posterior tendon or Achilles insertional tendinopathy. Here's the bone marrow edema. And so from the literature, although I'm sure I don't need to show you literature example, I'm sure you've all seen it yourself. Uh, this uh, subchondral cyst in the distal tibia uh, has bone marrow edema and therefore likely to be symptomatic on MRI, but here's the spec, easily seen. Beautiful concordance. Concordance approximately 80%, that's my own observation, but you can pull out literature, various papers where they have populations of patients with a complete imaging study, that is to say bone scan, bone spec CT, CT, MRI, and you will approximately generate that number, 80% concordance. Next point in contemporary bone scan, the spec CT. Um, uh, exquisite uh, bone detail. I would say 0.33 millimeters isotropic voxel is better than some of our routine protocols in the regular CT department. Uh, tremendous detail. It's been available since the early 2000s. And with SPEC CT, we have much improved specificity. I do believe, I agree with this paper, I mean, that's an exaggeration, but I do believe we have increased sensitivity with SPEC CT. And more importantly, SPEC CT will diminish the number of equivocal cases you have on a bone scan. So let me let me give you some examples of what I mean by specificity. And of course, with some assistance from x-rays. This particular injury, if you've never seen it before, you probably will not recognize it. You will not make the diagnosis. In years past, prior to SPEC CT, if you saw this, you have to be lucky uh, to get an x-ray to tell you that that is a fracture of the anterior process of talus, uh, of calcaneus, sorry. But in modern times, you don't need luck. But SPEC CT will immediately localize the abnormality and most of the time will even show you the fracture to tell you that's a fracture of the anterior process of calcaneus. So this, um, uh, this, uh, this uh, technical support staff in our uh, department uh, injured himself snowboarding. And uh, I have to be totally honest, when I looked at the planar, my first impression was that it's, a, it's an osteochondral injury. Here's something to speak with perhaps post-traumatic synovitis. So that was my simple-minded diagnosis, and I would be wrong. Spec CT shows me I'm wrong. That's an actual fracture of the lateral process of the talus. That's actually called a snowboarder's fracture. Um, so uh, it's been known from uh, decades ago, publication, uh, Dave Barnes uh, <clears throat> from Halifax had published decades ago that, uh, um, oh, sorry, <clears throat> wrong case. My apologies. Um, I, I could probably have passed this as just, uh, you know, degenerative disc disease of L5S1 and perhaps facet arthrop arthropathy here, but, you know, SPEC CT tells me I'm wrong. That's actual bone metastasis, uh, sclerotic bone metastasis from breast cancer. And again, we're talking specificity here. So this elite marathon runner of anybody would have the highest pretest likelihood for 
having a stress fracture, right? And that certainly looks like it could be a stress fracture, but Spec CT tells me no. In fact, that is just active osteoarthritis of the second TMT joint. Again, along the lines of specificity, um, this fellow with atraumatic pain for two months. You know, um, on a plain radiographs, that, that it was appropriately reported. That really is just a benign sclerotic lesion, you know, eccentric. I mean, that's probably uh, it's a, it's a pattern of a benign os fibrosis lesion, likely a large non-ossifying fibroma. It was appropriately reported, but clearly problematic when you get a bone scan, of course, to look for a fracture, looking like this, you start to doubt yourself. But again, spec CT brings us the specificity. It, it confirms number one, yeah, absolutely, that is inactive. That is completely irrelevant. Number two, uh, the activity arises from one of those rare cortical fractures, cortical longitudinal fractures, very difficult to diagnose, uh, and spec CT certainly helps. On the converse side, um, I don't fault the reporter for saying that that's active osteoarthritis. Uh, that's probably what I would say. Uh, but uh, to make a long story short, follow-up MRI uh, says, no, that's not correct. There is no arthritis in that joint. You do have edema isolated only to the uh, metatarsal head side of that joint. So more appropriately, it's either acute trauma, there's no history of trauma, or it's uh, Freiberg's infraction. Now, I, I do believe that SPEC CT would have shown exactly the same. We've, we would have come to that conclusion with SPEC CT, though. <clears throat> Obviously, the history still matters along with SPEC CT. So, this patient, that's clearly um, active, uh, typical uh, primary osteoarthritis in a typical location. That certainly could be arthritis, but the patient did injure his thumb specifically. So, it behooves us to investigate, and that is a fracture. That's not arthritis. And um, this patient absolutely has advanced osteoarthritis, unequivocally, multiple radiographs, um, but did sustain a very clear history of acute trauma. And I don't know, I, I, I can't lie, I can't say that I honestly recognize that perhaps that's excessively intense, but uh, lucky for me, SPEC CT uh, shows me that yes, there actually is, um, there actually is uh, an acute, uh, unusual plateau fracture superimposed on advanced osteoarthritis. Another example of specificity, this patient uh, sustained a major snowmobile accident. Radiographs, I mean, I, I, I think the radiographs could have been better reported, but nevertheless, the report is simply that, yes, there is a natural inferior glenoid fracture, but of unknown uh, chronology, unknown whether this is acute or subacute. So, in fact, the bone scan was requested purely just to uh, determine if that's acute or chronic. So let's let's look at the bone scan part of it. Just a simple planar set of images. Um, I don't know, I'll have to be honest, I'm not sure, uh, even after lots of coffee, I'm not sure if I recognize a glenoid fracture here. Uh, you know, on that view, I wonder if there's some glenohumeral arthritis. I do think, based on planar, uh, that that's a typical uh, greater tubercle fracture, right? In an elderly patient, I know this patient's not elderly, but that's a dime a dozen, fall on the shoulder, uh, tubercle fracture. But uh, SPEC CT tells me, no, absolutely not. There's a concavity here in the postural superior aspect of the humeral head. That's a typical hill sax deformity. The intense bone reaction is in that concavity. So this is not only a hill sax deformity, it's an acute or subacute hill sax deformity. And on the glenoid side, yes, absolutely, there is an acute natural inferior glenoid fracture uh, that's not displaced. And it, 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 it occupies perhaps 20% of that articular surface. So put that together, this is an acute um, dislocation, despite not telling us that the patient dislocated. This is an acute natural inferior dislocation of the shoulder. And uh, I can tell you that that's an indication for surgery, um, <clears throat> follow up, you know, after appropriate the acute phase. That, that is a legitimate indication because that is prone to chronic instability. I do believe that spec CT increases our sensitivity. Um, so uh, this is a pain diagram. And just as an aside, I find it very useful uh, for our technical staff to give us a diagram outlining roughly where the site of pain is. Um, so uh, crush injury several months ago and bone scan really ongoing pain, of course, uh, bone scan to look for evidence of acute uh, uh, occult fracture missed on radiographs. Uh, 
I'm not impressed by that planar image. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that I would have investigated this any further if, without that pain diagram and without that history. But nevertheless, SPECT CT tells me that that's very significant. You can see here the cuboid. This is the patient's contralateral side. This is the injured side. You can see that cuboid is just grossly abnormal contour. There's multiple small fragments, all smooth. So clearly this is old. This is remote, chronic, and, and with some activity. So the patient, you know, likely has uh, uh, post-traumatic arthrosis. That's just not obvious on, on the planar images. Spine imaging. So this is what I alluded to earlier. Um, Dave Barnes uh, from Dalhousie published uh, decades ago that in a young patient with back pain, you may not be able to see the spondylolysis on planar images. Okay, so we all know that from training. We are told never leave a young patient out of your department, a uh, young patient with back pain. Never let that young patient go without performing a SPECT study. So here is the spondylolysis. So prior to SPECT CT, you know, that's what we did, and, and, and that's excellent. But I would argue that in modern times, even that's not enough. So this, this young uh, gymnast, for example, with chronic low back pain, that's normal. And so is that. That is normal, okay? But SPECT CT will tell you that she's anything but normal. She has bilateral spondylolysis. And uh, if you don't already know, I should inform you, if you have bilateral spondylolysis, that is the worst a form of segmental instability you can have. And, uh, and that will lead to accelerated degenerative change. And you can see that already on the CT component. She's lost this kite. She's starting to form a small marginal osteophyte. Okay, so this patient is anything but normal. Or how about this young patient, this 18-year-old who presents with acute atraumatic back pain? You know, classic scintigraphy would teach us to say that, oh, that, that's just facet arthritis, no problem. Um, and, and even the SPECT will back you up on that. Well, that looks like facet arthritis, but you might think to yourself, if, you know, if you've had lots of coffee that day and you're extra sharp, you might think to yourself, wait a minute, 18-year-olds um, don't get active facet arthritis. By the way, that's not true. I've seen facet arthritis as young as 13, 14-year-olds. But aside from that, uh, you might think, well, okay, I'm smarter than that. Maybe that's just an atypical spondylolysis in an atypical location. And you're still not completely right. That's still wrong. So in modern times, SPECT CT shows that, in fact, he has bilateral spondylolysis. It just so happens one side is inactive, it's chronic, and the other side is acute or subacute, concordant with the history. And it looks like facet arthrosis because the fracture line just has, um, is atypical, it deviates, it exits the superior articular uh, process of that level rather than the classic um, uh, intraarticularis zone. So that's bilateral spondylolysis. One side's acute, one side's chronic. Now, just if you're not aware, it is important to know whether spondylolysis is acute or chronic because um, spondylolysis can resolve. A small uh, fraction of people with spondylolysis will actually heal. And physiatrists and other uh, physicians who have to deal with this entity um, are quite a well are quite aware of that. They just they can't predict who will possibly resolve? They do have maneuvers, they do have management uh, strategies, but they know in their literature that, that it only works if uh, the uh, spondylolysis can be shown to be acute or subacute. They know for a fact that all of their maneuvers will not work, will have no effect if it's chronic. So here's as an example, this spondylolysis, you can see it's not that active and presumably it's already on its way healing, but at one point in time, you can still see the spondylolysis, and only seven months later, it's almost completely fused. Okay, I promise you, this is the same patient, same side. I'm not pulling a trick here, okay? It is fused. Let's further talk specificity. This 57-year-old male clearly has advanced degenerative disc disease, known to have facet arthrosis, has increasing back pain in one month. This bone scan was really only performed just preceding facet joint therapy, just to identify targets. and. Uh, you know, <laughs> simple-mindedly to me, I, I, I think that's bilateral active facet arthritis. So imagine my shock when I saw this on SPECT CT. That's actually advanced discitis. Here's the follow-up MRI. Another example, unexplained medial ankle pain, query stress fracture. So that's appropriate. That's an appropriate indication for a bone scan. Uh, X-ray was reported as normal. 
so on the planar image, you know, I suppose you could call that an atypical stress fracture. Sure, why not? But, you know, that's an unusual, that's an atypical location for a stress fracture. Spec CT tells me that, in fact, he has a big uh, erosion there, and you're seeing bone reaction to that erosion. Furthermore, uh, there's, there's calcification in that adjacent deltoid ligament. Okay, that's a very short differential diagnosis here. Uh, you know, gout or other depositional arthropathy or, or, or CPPD, calcium pyrophosphate depositional disease. The latter doesn't really, is non-erosive. So, you know, likely gout. There is only one diagnosis. He does have gout. It's just, you know, unfortunately they didn't, they neglected to tell us that. Would have, would have, you know, speeded up the study. Um, an equivocal pelvic fracture is not so equivocal if you can see the bone deformity <clears throat> on spec CT, just as an example. It's very easy to show the site of active impingement on spec CT. Here's an example of anteromedial impingement. You can see the impingement site, uh, bone reaction at the impingement site. People with flat foot get a peculiar form of impingement known as subtalar impingement. Um, some authors will emphasize the term extra-articular to emphasize that you're not looking at arthropathy. You're looking at abnormal axial loading because of the flat foot. You've shifted the weight bearing anteriorly inappropriately. And you can see here there's a lateral predominance to that impingement so, so that as it progresses, you can actually get subfibular impingement, which foot surgeons well recognize. And so here it is on SPECT CT, beautifully demonstrated. That's typical pattern of subtalar impingement. Now, let me demonstrate the specificity in this means. These radiographs were only obtained after the SPEC CT. This patient was not documented to even have flat foot. Okay, so there were multiple pre existing radiographs, but none of them were weight bearing. You couldn't tell he had flat foot. But I would say the SPEC CT was highly suggestive. And so, you know, when I requested follow up weight bearing views, this is flat foot. He, that, that's why he has um, chronic hind foot discomfort, impingement. Orthopedic problems are, are well demonstrated on spec CT. So um, when you have spinal fusion, the fusion block is solid. It's mechanically solid. That's the intention. So if you have a solid block, you can't have active degenerative disc disease or facet arthrosis. But unfortunately, what happens is the, the mechanical weight loading gets shifted to the next level. So we're not shocked to find that there is very active. When you get a bone scan for such a patient, unexplained recurrent back pain, you will not be shocked to find that there is now new active facet arthrosis adjacent to the fusion block. So here it is. And the converse to that, if you should so see within a fusion block, uh, intensely active facet arthritis or even spondylolysis, one on each side, that tells you that it's failed fusion. That can't possibly happen in a fusion block unless the fusion has failed. This is failed fusion. Or this more extreme example, extensive fusion, L3 all the way to S1. It is not possible in a fusion block to have ongoing active, intense degenerative disc disease, even with vacuum phenomena. The only way that's possible is if there is a failure of that fusion. And in this case, you can see why. There's um, that, that, that S1 screw is loose. It, it was reported radiographically that there is probable loosening of the S1. That's the only way you can have recurrent uh, active degenerative disc disease within the fusion block. So here's a demonstration, a dramatic demonstration of that effect. This uh, patient with multi-level facet arthrosis, um, you know, you could inject any of these levels. They're all advanced facet arthrosis. Uh, clearly, uh, L4-5 here, you can see there's actual degenerative um, spondylosis, the degenerative anterolisthesis, a uh, slip, forward slip, grade one. And therefore, not surprised to find that that's the level that's most active. That's the level that I would inject if I was asked to inject. Now, I'm assuming she had other indications, perhaps neurologic. So appropriately, she gets fusion. She gets fusion from L4 to S1, thereby curing her of the mechanical etiology of back pain in, in 4-5. But of course, look what, look what happens. Your mechanical stress load shifts to the next level. So she gets new active facet arthrosis, right? Uh, in L34, uh, not surprising. And so what does she do? She gets more uh, fusion. The surgeon offers for more fusion and starts to relieve her of the 3-4 facet arthritis. But look what's happening. She now shifts to the next level where you will likely have very active facet arthrosis adjacent to the fusion block uh, in L23. 
So atraumatic pain, two weeks. Here's a radiograph from four days prior, negative for fracture. I'd like to say that I was sharp enough to recognize that fracture, but I really wasn't. I'll be honest, I didn't recognize. I mean, I guess in retrospect, that is prominent, but spec CT tells me that no, there is a fracture. <clears throat> So when I look at this and I'm on injection duty, I think I'm going to have a bad day. But um, you know, if I have a spec CT, I'm I'm a little happier knowing I only really need to go after just that one joint. Okay, so finally, I, I'd like to convince you all that occasionally you can directly see the soft tissue pathology on a bone scan as outlined by the tracer, or at least you can possibly infer the pathology. So this is an elite junior hockey player, Edmonton Oil King, now an NHL player. And at the time, um, he sustained a severe twisting injury to the ankle and could no longer weight bear and could not. So clearly, there's a significant clinical concern for a fracture. Um, I think you'll agree with me, that's not a fracture pattern, right? It's not, for a young person, that's not anywhere near an intense, but it's clearly abnormal. And so what is it? You could propose maybe it's contusion. But again, remember, the history is a twisting. It's not a direct impact it's not a direct blow to the ankle um so spec ct shows this and now you know so what is that you can think two ways you can you can either think clinically or you can think anatomically so clinically the the uh, sports medicine position the, the, certainly the team doctor is well aware that in hockey players the skates uh, beautifully protect their ankle but not so the highest level uh, just beyond the skate support the, the, the one ligamentous structure that is exposed is the tib-fib ligaments. And so that's called a high ankle sprain if you tear one of those. You're not likely to, um, you either fracture, you, you either outright produce a fracture, or you get a high ankle sprain. So that's clinically. Now, I'm, <laughs> I don't have that knowledge, and I don't, but I can only think anatomically. Anatomically, if you know the distribution of the distal tibia fibula ligament, you realize right away this is clearly outlining following the path of the distal syndesmosis. So it's not outrageous to, to, to suggest perhaps this is not a bone injury at all. It's a ligamentous injury of the distal syndesmosis. That is to say the distal tibial fibula ligament. Okay, so I had a discussion with the team doctor, and I know now, I didn't know back then, um, in the sports medicine world, they are, they are absolutely strict with that injury. If it can be shown that you have a high ankle sprain, it's six weeks off skating, off weight bearing, no questions, <laughs> no debates, no questions asked. As opposed to if you really have an occult fracture, they're a little more liberal, you may go back and skate with maybe a little painkiller, et cetera. And I did tell the physician uh, after uh, putting this on paper that you're gonna have to get an MRI because what I'm about to say is not documented in the literature. So here's the follow-up MRI. Uh, that is a high grade tear. I mean, in fact, it is a complete tear. And so this is the distribution of activity. That's a high grade uh, anterior tibial fibular ligament tear. And this is the patient with both anterior and posterior ligament tear. Here's the follow up MRI. That's a grossly abnormal thickened ligament, presumably on its way to rescarring. Uh, even the posterior tibial fibular ligament, you can see continuity, but you can still see some residual edema corresponding with the SPECT CT findings. This is exactly the distribution of the deep deltoid ligament. I don't have follow-up MRI. I'm just showing you the anatomy, both on the coronal and a sagittal view. That's exactly the deep dis deltoid distribution. I do have follow-up on this case. Same injury, uh, deltoid ligament. Here's the follow-up on spec CT. And here's the follow-up MRI. Notice the bone marrow edema. And, uh, and, and this, is, this, this is the ligament with a tear. Admittedly, a low-grade tear, but a tear nevertheless. And this is exactly the distribution of the anterior and posterior talofibular ligament. Now, this is not the patient's follow-up MRI. I don't have follow-up. This is a textbook example, normal, abnormal. It's not difficult to imagine that this would look like that on MRI, okay? Anterior and posterior talofibular ligament tears. And this is what it would look like on a coronal. Uh, this I do have follow-up on. You know, I, I have to be honest. If I'm reporting just a planar, my first diagnosis would be to say that that's, well, that's just subtalar arthritis, right? What's the big deal? Subtalar arthritis. Uh, if it's a young patient, maybe I'll think, you know, per perhaps unusual talocalcaneal coalition. But that's not the history, and that's not what SPECT-CT tells us. SPECT-CT says there's activity in the lateral malleolus, the lateral tubercle, and the posterior periphery of the talus, and activity appearing to want to traverse in between. And so that is 
this is the patient's MRI. This is posterior talofibular ligament territory, and you can see the partially torn, swollen, edematous ligament with, again, the bone marrow edema. So there's a, there's a nice, there's an interesting social history behind this one that I'd like to share. This is a, a college athlete, uh, University of Alberta Golden Bears. Um, he's a football player. He injured uh, his foot with a severe twisting mechanism. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't really recognize what that pattern is. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, but spec CT to me was revealing because it shows um, the activity is intense in a soft tissue space between the anterior process of calcaneus, the corner of the cuboid, and adjacent navicular. I'd have to show you another uh, scan to demonstrate the, uh, the navicular. But this makes no sense unless you think anatomically and, and realize that uh, uh, this is the location of a major ligament called a bifurcate ligament. Okay, so it's not outrageous to suggest that perhaps he tore his bifurcate ligament. So here's the story. I'm sitting at uh, Commonwealth Stadium, uh, Edmonton Eskimos, or previously called the Edmonton Eskimos, previously a winning team. Um, and the person sitting beside me, a season ticket holder, knows me. Uh, he's a physicist from our department. And he comes up to me and he says, Dr. Jen. So at this point, of course, I'm getting very nervous. He doesn't call me Dr. Jen. And he tells me, you reported the CAT scan. He says CAT scan on my, uh, my daughter's uh, boyfriend. So of course, at this point, I'm getting really nervous. I start to sweat. I start, on my, I start to have my heart rate rises. I'm denying everything. And he says, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I just want to let you know he paid for a private MRI. And you said that he has some form of a ligament tear of the bifurcate ligament. I just want to let you know that they do agree with you on MRI. So immediately I'm relieved. I know that I'm not, not about to be sued, number one. And number two, I, I get a follow-up MRI for correlation. So here it is. You can notice the bone marrow edema, anterior processed calcaneus, the corner of cuboid. You can see the ligaments start to reappear. There's been, I think, at least a month between the MRI and that spec CT. So that's a bifurcate ligament injury. Um, again, the pain diagram, this patient uh, fell on uh, an outstretched hand. Uh, radiographs are negative for fracture, but I know exactly where the pain uh, is. It's right here. <clears throat> and planar images, well, there's something there. I don't recognize what that is on planar images. It's not really a fracture pattern. It's not an osteochondral injury. Maybe it's arthritis, but uh, odd. And spec CT can be even more odd if you don't think anatomically. You know, I, I don't know of anything. If you don't think anatomically, I can't imagine anything else that can give you this bizarre pattern of intense activity with oblique orientation, unless you think anatomically. I'm going to tell you from experience, that is the most commonly injured ligament, the RSC, radial scaphoid capitate ligament. It's the largest of the extrinsic volar capsular ligament. It's basically a portion of the capsule. It is, for example, the most common site for post-traumatic ganglion formation right here at the radial stylus. So I have no doubt that is a tear of the radial scaphoid capitate. Now, I don't have follow-up MRI. I'm going to point out that I did recommend it. It wasn't done. And gone are the days where I could fudge the MRI list <laughs> for my own gains for fearing that I'm going to be caught one day and be stripped of my rights <laughs> to practice. So I don't do that anymore. Here's another injury uh, to the hand. Um, and planar images show activity from the third to the fifth MCP and in their bases. And the SPECT CT is even more bizarre, third to fifth uh, MCP and their corresponding bases with activity appearing to traverse uh, the soft tissue space. Again, it makes no sense unless you think anatomically. There are dominant intermetacarpal ligaments at the level of the MCP joints and in their base. I have no doubt this is a severe ligament. Well, I shouldn't say severe. This is a ligamentous injury. Um, soft tissue pathology, unexplained medial ankle pain. So perhaps contusion, you might think, but there's no traumatic history. This is completely atraumatic. Spec CT confirms, yes, for sure, it is the medial malleolus that's showing the reaction. But the CT component does show that the adjacent tendon, tibialis posterior, is swollen. And in fact, the contour is abnormal. If you know um, uh, the anatomy in this area, that's an abnormal contour. So it's not outrageous to consider perhaps we're just looking at bone reaction to adjacent soft tissue pathology, which of course would be severe tendinopathy. So that's how it was reported. Um, here's a follow-up MRI. 
Uh, now, I have to say, uh, first of all, I, I was quite annoyed at my MSK colleague uh, because on his report, his first line was to say that unexplained ankle pain, no prior imaging reports, okay? <laughs> After all that effort, no prior imaging assessment. Uh, I was not impressed. <laughs> so anyways, uh, notice the concordance, bone marrow edema, bone reaction, and, and here is the severely tendinotic uh, tibialis posterior tendon with a longitudinal tear. Unexplained lateral pain, atraumatic. Um, Clearly, there's some abnormalities here, but you know that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't recognize that offhand. The tubular distribution of blood pooling on a, on the blood pool image does make you wonder about tendinopathy, right, from tenosynovitis and tenosynovitis. Okay, the spec CT is very revealing. There's activity specifically in the posterior aspect of the lateral malleolus, in the lateral surface of the calcaneus, specifically posterior to the um, peroneal tubercle and on the undersurface of the cuboid. Okay, so I, I would venture to you that if you spoke to an orthopedic surgeon on the phone and all you said was the following, you say, I don't know what's wrong, but I, I do see there is abnormal bone reaction in your patients uh, uh, in these locations, the posterior surface of lateral malleolus, the lateral surface of calcaneus, the undersurface of cuboid. I guarantee you that that foot surgeon would say to you, are you trying to tell me there's something wrong with the patient's peroneus longus tendon? Because that's exactly what you're describing. Now, in fairness, if you look at the CT, you can see an asymmetry. You know, this, this is a symptomatic side, a little bit swollen, okay, compared to the asymptomatic side. Here's the follow-up MRI. Again, notice the concordance, bone marrow edema, bone reaction, okay, bone marrow edema, bone marrow edema. And yes, this is severe tenosynovitis of the common peroneal tendencies. And the patient I won't belabor the point, but patient does have um, severe uh, tendinopathy of peroneus longus tendon. And I'll leave you with this final case. Um, hind foot pain, NYD, that's the exact uh, history provided. So this is bizarre. Like that doesn't recognize, that doesn't remind me of anything I know from planar uh, literature. Uh, however, to me, spec CT is very revealing. Okay, you notice that the bone tracer distribution is predominantly within soft tissue space. Not entirely, but predominantly within soft tissue space, okay? And it's in this space. In this space, and there is some medial prominence, but that too is within soft tissue. In this space is known as the sinus tarsi. It's a, it's a large fatty space filled with neurovascular structures and filled with traversing interosseous ligaments. And um, this would be completely bizarre unless you, unless you are aware, somehow aware of the fact that 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 space can have pathology. There's a syn syndrome well known to um, physiatrists and orthopedic surgeons and you know sports medicine specialists. There's a there's a syndrome called the sinus tarsi syndrome, whereby that entire space, the normal fat, is replaced by granulation tissue, inflammatory slash granulation tissue, and it's a benign. It's effectively a post-traumatic. It's multiple etiology, but most of the time trauma, uh, severe post-traumatic sequelae and it's very painful and it's a syndrome that the clinicians claim they can diagnose clinically because there are apparently some examination maneuvers and they can make that diagnosis so they claim it's a clinical diagnosis but if you were to image this is what you would see on imaging okay and so i have no doubt that likely is what we're looking at the sinus tarsi syndrome in this patient again i reckon i, I recommend an mri but i, I don't have follow-up because i don't want to get in trouble <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in summary, um, the rich literature we have from classic bone scintigraphy, all legitimate. We all have to learn them. Residents have to learn them, and even just SPECT alone, very useful. They all we have to learn the patterns. But in modern times, with contemporary bone scintigraphy, I think if we emphasize anatomy and we maximize what we can from SPECT CT, and we just borrow some of the con the concept of bone marrow edema. If we borrow that from musculoskeletal imaging, because there's a big, big literature, volumes of data on on patterns uh, that are diagnostically powerful. If we if we port that into our diagnostic approach, and if we also accept the thought that occasionally you can directly see the soft tissue pathology, or at least infer the soft tissue pathology, then I think uh, modern uh, bone scan uh, has a lot to offer. It's far more specific. We have much improved sensitivity, uh, far more diagnostically powerful than you may think.
thank you. These are my affiliations.